Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for this week's um, show, Thursdays with AARP Wisconsin. I am Amber Miller, Associate State Director of Community Outreach for AARP Wisconsin, and also your host. So I want to thank you so much for joining us. Before we get to our show, always a friendly reminder that you can find all upcoming virtual events and information at the AARP Wisconsin webpage, which is below. Please visit there as often as you would like. We are updating it not only with um, upcoming events, but also information about the COVID vaccine for the state of Wisconsin. Also remember the AARP Friendly Voice. This initiative started last year where you could talk to one of our trained AARP volunteers just to hear a friendly voice on the other end. So you can find information below or call the phone number if that is easier to put a request in. And once again, it is free. You do not need to be a member and you could be any age. And if you're looking to volunteer with AARP Wisconsin, they're, we're always looking for great volunteers and there is actually information and opportunities available even virtually. So you can um, follow the website below for more information. So if you're looking outside your window, it, it might actually be snowing right now. And if not, we know that it is winter or cold months here, at least it seems like more than half the year. So today we are going to be discussing embracing winter in Wisconsin. And I know that could be kind of hard, but we know we chose to live here, so we need to find uh, ways to embrace winter. So we have a couple of guests with us today. So we have guests from um, uh, Eau Claire and also 880 Cities Winter Mission um, city. So we're going to be talking to them today. So I want to welcome, um, well, our, so I want to welcome our first guest. So our first guest is um, David Seymour. He is the senior project manager with 880 Cities. And then we have two other guests that we're going to be talking to after David. Hi, David. How are you doing today? I'm good, Amber. How are you? Doing well. And you are from Toronto. I just found that out. So you are very familiar with winter weather. Yes, we we love complaining about our winters in Toronto. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our viewers today might have never heard of 880 Cities. So can you tell us a little bit about 880 Cities? And then also as a reminder to our viewers, if you have any questions during this program, you could please post them below and we will take them shortly. Thanks, Amber. So yeah, 880 Cities uh, is a nonprofit organization based in Toronto, Canada, and our mission is to improve the quality of life for people living in cities, regardless of their age, ability, or socioeconomic status. We believe, uh, next slide, that uh, if everything we did in our cities, if the way we designed our streets, our intersections, our public spaces, if everything we did in our cities was great for an eight-year-old and for an 80-year-old, it would be really great for everyone. So, you know, when we talk about an 880 city, when we talk about age-friendly city, we're talking about reclaiming and reaffirming the right to the city for people of all ages. We believe that all human beings have a right to mobility, a right to public space in the city, and a right to participate in decision-making processes that affects them, because these are things that belong to all of us. And this really coincides or goes hand in hand with the AARP livable community. So if you're listening to this right now thinking, wow, 880 City sounds a lot like livable communities, I think you might see some synergy here. So this is great. So what drew 880 Cities to look at winter and winter cities? Yeah, so first and foremost, it was our, our own lived experience. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. as Toronto, we do get winters. It is a winter mm -hmm. city. And, you know, amongst our team, we'd always talk about how much winter impacts our access to those three rights, our own connections to civic engagement, to mobility, to public space, fray considerably in Toronto during the winter. And, you know, we can see that from our office windows. Winter in North America has really big impacts on many different communities, and most of them, unfortunately, tend to be negative impacts. You know, for example, if you have a mobility device, if you need a cane, if you have any kind of physical mm -hmm. ailment, you're in a lot of trouble in winter, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there was a, actually a recent news report from Winnipeg uh, where they talked to a woman who uses a wheelchair and she described how snowstorms isolate people with disabilities. She explained how poor snow clearance makes it virtually impossible for her to go about her daily life and access essentials like going to the grocery store or to the doctor's office. Um, you know, we know also that the data tells us that it's, you know, women in racialized and lower income communities are far more likely to rely on walking and taking public transit to get around. Yet most cities don't plow sidewalks or around transit stations and bus stops. Mm -hmm. And 
The few cities that do tend to treat them as afterthoughts. They tend to prioritize major arterial roads and highways. Mm -hmm. And the effects of those policies is that we make winter much more livable for select people who drive cars, who tend to be men, white, and more affluent, while making winter a lot less comfortable for women in racialized and lower income communities. And you know, not coincidentally, it's women in racialized and lower income communities who are four times more likely to suffer from depression and anxiety in winter. Mm -hmm. you know, we also know that children you know, in that states who see levels of physical activity and recreation, which are already quite low, they, they tend to fall even lower in winter, which you know, further contributes to this really big public health and mental health crises that we're seeing in North America. And so you know, for those are reasons, that's why we really zeroed in on a lack of winter planning as a big issue in creating more age-friendly cities. And the most frustrating thing is, is that winter doesn't actually need to be like this. Mm -hmm. You know, we have really built our cities to avoid winter rather than adapting and embracing it. So the way that we design and maintain and program our cities is the biggest contributor to this growing sense of social isolation. Um, you know, winter can be a wonderful time of the year that supports social interaction and physical activity. Our cities just haven't been designed and programmed to take advantage of it. And um, David, I, I appreciate some of those pictures because especially living in Wisconsin, um, that seems to be our every day, especially from like November till almost sometimes May is when we get a big winter storm. And, you know, it is all about perception. So some of us might be looking at it like, ooh, we hate winter, but yeah, finding fun and creative ways, especially during COVID when we know that it's already difficult to be out in winter. So you launched um, Winter Mission a couple of years ago. Can you tell us a little bit about that program? Yeah, so Winter Mission was really geared towards trying to achieve what you just talked about, finding those creative ways to make winter more enjoyable. So this program was launched in November of 2018 uh, with a national call for program partners. We were challenging U.S. cities to assemble diverse teams committed to increasing access to social and physical activity in winter. We would then sort of select three winning cities who we'd work with to pilot and implement creative solutions to combating social isolation and hopefully try and build that foundation for creating cities that view winter as an asset to be embraced. Uh, the Winter Mission Project was a response to a call for grant proposals from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in CAF America, uh, and we just really want to thank them so much for their support in funding the project. Um, in total, uh, over 60 cities applied for to be one of the three winter cities, and um, we selected you know, as I mentioned, three of them, each of varying sizes, three fantastic cities, and they were Buffalo, New York, Oladville, Colorado, and of course, fantastic Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And as mentioned, we'll be getting to hear from Jake and Courtney from Eau Claire right, right after me. Um, so the Winter Mission Project as a whole unfolded over three key phases. In the first case phase, we worked with each of the three cities to engage the residents in a citywide conversation about winter life. And then the second phase, each of the cities received a $15,000 seed funding micro grant to pilot community ideas for improving winter public life. And then in the third and final phase, we took all the lessons we learned from the engagement and the piloting to develop winter city strategies, which outline the key steps Buffalo, Eau Claire, and Leadville can take in becoming even more winter friendly places where people of all ages and backgrounds can reap the benefits of the season. Uh, throughout all three phases, it was really important that we used, you know, an asset and equity based approach in developing winter solutions. You know, we first wanted to sort of identify what winter programs and policies were working really well and how could we build on those successes and ensure that even more people can reap from the benefits of winter, which then, of course, also begs the question of who isn't currently benefiting from what winter has to offer and how do we develop solutions to address those systemic barriers that certain groups face in enjoying the season. And then you know, just everything that we learned over the course of the projects captured and put up on our Winter Cities Toolkit website. So this includes all of our engagement findings, case studies for certain policy and program ideas, links to external city building plans and other tools and resources. So if our viewers are looking, um, are viewing this right now with us live, we definitely encourage you to look at that website um, about creative ways, but also to, you know, their findings. And once again, I'm in Milwaukee, you just started snowing now. So I'm going to be looking at that toolkit this afternoon, David. Um, so we were talking <laughs> a little bit about COVID and of course COVID kind of has changed the way we do everything in life for almost a year now. So how has COVID impacted your approach to winter cities? Yeah, so I mean, I'd say definitely COVID has made this work even more sort of urgent. It's really, you know, made clear that we can't be, we can't be passive about mm -hmm. changing our approach to planning and designing cities for winter. 
you know, in, in the first month of pandemic, uh, studies showed that levels of loneliness across the country increased by 20 to 30 percent. And, you know, beyond this, the pandemic exacerbated existing social inequalities with older adults, with people of color and individuals of lower income bearing the brunt of this crisis. And these are the exact same groups that are higher risk of social isolation to begin with and the exact same groups that face significant barriers to their quality of life throughout winter. So, you know, given these compounding effects of the pandemic, of social isolation, of winter, you know, we really believe that the, the work and the spirit of winter mission and winter cities is more relevant now than ever. The pandemic has, yeah, just really illustrated, as you merely mentioned, just how important mm -hmm. the high access to high quality shared space and shared outdoor space in particular is, right? Um, yeah, you know, so many cities and communities are struggling to meet that demand for outdoor space. They're, they're feeling the effects of decades of disinvestment in parks and public spaces. And COVID has really made those fault lines even more clear. And so, David, what are some of the lessons or takeaways from the winter mission? If you could share some of that with our audience. Yeah, so I'll definitely let, you know, Jake and, and, and Courtney share, you know, some of the examples from Eau Claire. So I'll, I'll maybe speak a bit more to Buffalo and Leadville. Okay. Um, and you know, definitely one of the big takeaways is that, you know, community engagement is a lot more fun when we do it outdoors. Mm -hmm. And that engagement in winter can absolutely take place outside. Uh, this is an image from Buffalo where we kicked off all of the engagement events with a neighborhood party in Martin Luther King Park. There was a DJ, there was free hot chocolate, there was s'mores and portable fire pits. The mayor came out, took some selfies, started hearing from residents about the barriers they encounter in winter. Um, you know, there are also some, we did some similar sort of events in Leadville, you can see here. And, you know, part of what Winter Mission was trying to do was to, to your point, change people's mindsets and perceptions mm -hmm. about and what these engagement events demonstrate is that with very little capital investment, there's a real clear appetite for winter programming in neighborhood parks, and that it doesn't really cost much to plug an iPhone into some portable speakers to create that fun atmosphere. You know, marshmallows and hot chocolate are not expensive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sugar is a very uh, affordable, <laughs> but very super effective way to get bring people engaged asses. in these conversations. Yeah. Yes, sugar brings some asses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you know, another takeaway we got from this project is that, you know, again, small investments can make a big difference. One of Buffalo's pilot projects was a series of small micro grants of up to $1,000 for local communities to help with sidewalk snow clearance or running neighborhood winter walking groups. You know, that's really small dollar amounts that can have big impacts on the day-to-day -day quality of life for a lot of people. And the last highlight, uh, you know, I'll quickly just mention is, just the importance of needing to apply the winter mission lens elsewhere. You know, there, there are major racial and economic, economic barriers in place of all of our cities that winter only exacerbates. And engaging communities throughout this process, issues outside the strict scope of winter mission, of winter cities kept coming up. Um, an example of that from Buffalo is that we heard some community members uh, that it was really hard for them to consider going outside in winter um, when their own homes weren't adequately protected from the cold. Mm -hmm. Now, Winter Mission wasn't technically supposed to be looking at private indoor spaces, but we, we couldn't really ignore this really important problem. So Buffalo took that feedback and partnered with Senior Services and National Fuel to provide 200 Winter Mission weatherization kits in HUD-eligible neighborhoods. And then while the kits were being handed out, the city took the opportunity to offer socialization supports, health checks, clean energy audits, and other winter resources. Um, a similar sort of example from Leadville was the last thing was just, you know, we heard from members from the Latinx community uh, that there were major barriers preventing them from engaging in physical activity outdoors in winter uh, was fear of police harassment. Um, that feedback has led Leadville to start sort of rethinking their approaches to policing public spaces and consider sanctuary city policies. It's, again, definitely not something that winter mission technically focused on. It's maybe not the thing that you really think of when you think about winter cities. But, you know, if we're serious about wanting to create equitable winter cities, we, we can't shy away from these major systemic issues. Absolutely. And um, David, very eye-opening. Once again, it's all about changing the way that we look at winter in all of our seasons. And especially during, a, you know, a pandemic, there are still some very creative yet fun and safe things that we can still do to help with the isolation and making sure that we're looking after our neighbors during this time too. So I appreciate you framing this out a little bit for us. We're going to bring on Courtney and Jake. We're gonna have you um, come back in just a few minutes and we're gonna be taking some questions from our audience. And so thank you so much, David. So next I would love to introduce, we have Courtney Drax 
Chancellor, yes, Policy and Systems Division Manager with the Eau Claire Health Department, and Jake Wassey. Yes. Oh, Rassy. Rassy. You had two four, and then you went to zero R's. Very I don't know what I did there. Yep, thank you so much. Um, the Legislative and Community Relations Liaison with UW, with UW Eau Claire. Um, so, and I, sh I apologize about that. I even tried to practice, but I want to thank you guys both for being here. And I think David has done a really great job of kind of framing out what 880 cities are and how amazing it is that you guys, the city was chosen as one of um, three cities. So Courtney, I kind of want to start with you and what prompted um, Eau Claire to become involved with Open Winter Mission? Yeah, with Winter Mission. Oh, and I, apo is an no, I apologize. We're going to start and with the video. Attitude the video. changes everything. When the temperature drops and that glimmering snow falls, a whole new world of opportunity awaits. Here in Eau Claire, we're proud of winter. With each season's change, we get new things to do. We have new places to be and a chance to try something out of the ordinary. Because when winter comes to Eau Claire, we learn about ourselves and about the value of our community, how to get out and find a little hustle and bustle and how to pull in to find some quiet and warmth. But mostly, winter rekindles a sense of wonder as wide as the starry night sky and it keeps you grounded in what's really important. You, the ones you love, the place you call home. Winter, like attitude, changes everything because it can make life better. So what a really fun and cool video to kind of represent all the fun activities in winter. Um, so thank you guys again. So I apologize. We were going to show that video just to kind of also frame out. So um, Courtney, so what got you, what prompted Eau Claire to become part um, of the winter mission? Yeah, when we saw the winter mission grant opportunity, we were really just drawn to it because both mental health and physical activity were identified by our community as some of our top health concerns, which matched really well with the focus of winter mission. And the idea of switching, we've always viewed winter as a barrier to mental health and to physical activity and something that we we just try to get through. And so winter mission's idea of embracing winter and having that be a strength of Eau Claire um, was something that we latched onto and wanted to, to make that shift. Um, additionally, winter mission focused on having a collaborative project, it wasn't just one organization that was creating a change. And we knew to create a change about how we think about winter, something that's been ingrained in us since we've been born, our view of winter, uh, we need more than one organization. And we also appreciated the focus on engagement of, of the community. Like David shared, that was one of our first steps was working with the community to learn from them and not just assuming that we had all the answers and knew what was the next steps. Um, so kind of all three of those things made us really excited about the Winter Mission Project and really uh, lucky and happy that we were one of three cities selected. Mm -hmm. And how was the equity and inclusion looked at when selecting your projects? Yeah, so our projects were really based off of the community feedback. Um, we did some pop-up engagements, uh, surveys, and focus groups with the community to learn what they thought about winter and what we could do to make winter more enjoyable. I don't think surprising to anybody, the if we could control how winter, how harsh winter was, that was the top way that we could make it more enjoyable. Um, but accessibility and access um, to, to resources were brought up in those, through those surveys and pop-up engagements. And so that was really helped focus um, what we selected as pilot projects. Um, so we, based on accessibility, safety of the sidewalks or clearing of sidewalks was never really given top, top priority plowing the streets um, and making sure that cars were very car centric um, here in Eau Claire. So what we did was we created a winter route. Um, so on a bike pass, we have a four mile route that is giving high, given high priority when it snows. So that is always clear and safe for people to walk, run or do other activities on in the winter. Um, the other activity that we picked or focus area that we picked was gear share. Um, so winter activities can be really expensive and that is a barrier for people to to start a different activity or even know where to start. Um, so thinking about how we could make um, activities more accessible, buying snowshoes and having them rentable from the, the local library or ice fishing kits so that people could try out something um, if they hadn't ever learned about it. 
And so what are the plans for Eau Claire? What are what what is part of the future now that you have winter mission? Yeah, some of our plans have been put on a little bit of a halt because of COVID. I think we're really excited once we can start gathering again. We have some exciting plans in place for winter events um, and winter gathering spaces in Eau Claire. Right now, we're focusing on a lot of um, social media of how can people still be um, active out in winter and have some opportunities to, in a COVID safe way, um, still engage with others. So a lot of fun social media challenges this year. One that I'm very excited about um, is a um, snowman challenge. So once we get some packable snow, we'll have some snowmen's or snow sculptures um, out throughout Eau Claire competing for, for some awards. And if people want to look at that, is there a website or if you could plug your Facebook page when eventually you get to that challenge, if people wanted to look at it? Yeah, if you go to owinter.com, that'd be the best place to go learn more. Beautiful. Beautiful. And what a great idea, too. So thank you so much, Courtney. And so, Jake, thank you. And sorry again about your last name. So, Jake, you've been involved with um, Oak their winter mission effort from the beginning as a university representative. So why do the university want to get involved with this project? Well, that's right. And thank you, Amber. It's, it's great to be here today. Uh, and I really appreciate David and Courtney adding their expertise. Uh, from the university's perspective, uh, the, the community does better when we're all doing better. Chancellor mm -hmm. Schmidt uh, at UW-Eau Claire likes to, I think that's Paul Wellstone from Minnesota. We all do better when we all do better. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got involved with Winter Mission Eau Claire because we're a community partner uh, and we see it as a state institution, as our responsibility to help ensure that this is a region that can sustain its workforce, that is attractive for people of all backgrounds. Uh, and, and winter is a defining and positive characteristic of life in northwestern Wisconsin. With that being said, though, that's there's a certain amount of common sense that comes with having lived in that environment mm -hmm. for a long time. You've had grandparents and parents who impart these little pearls of wisdom. Uh, but it's important to remember that common sense, uh, you know, sort of contradictorily, is not common. It's based mm -hmm. on your individual experiences with reality and what makes sense to you. Your common sense is shared with people who have had those similar experiences. What happens when somebody who didn't have a grandpa who loved winter? Uh, what happens when somebody who grew up in an arid or very dry or tropical climate moves here? They may not be given the tools. So it's important to keep in mind that we are always uh, talking to people beyond our own group and our own common sense when we engage on winter. So, you know, how many times have you heard, you know, four wheel drive doesn't mean you have four wheel stop or walk mm -hmm. like a penguin, you won't slip on the ice, snow brush, emergency blanket, uh, mm -hmm. heating hand warmers in your car, uh, never pass a snow plow, and of course don't mm -hmm. eat yellow snow. But if you yeah. haven't heard those things your whole life, you don't have some of the basic information to become acquainted with winter. And on top of that, you're encountering people that because we've lived with winter in some cases for decades and generations going back through our agricultural tradition, winter is something to be endured. And we have mm -hmm. kind of a, you know, grin and bear it sarcastic attitude, but that makes it all the more difficult for somebody who hasn't come to enjoy winter yet to get involved. And what really stood out to us when we started, uh, we knew that there are health disparities in Eau Claire and that so often that goes toward underrepresented minorities in our community. And we've seen COVID and, uh, and winter have increasing effects on those who are already at a disadvantage. Uh, Eau Claire is a vibrant city in the summer. We come together, we, we gather. When we started Winter Mission, we realized that only 13% of events in Eau Claire took place between October and March. Wow. Half the year when there was so yeah. much to do and our first survey found almost two in four, more than two in four people in Eau Claire identified winter as harsh, cold, and long. That's mm -hmm. a, a common paradigm. But one in four said it's it's beautiful, stunning, and amazing. Mm -hmm. People are out there that enjoy this sport and can help share and pass on that love. It's about making connections. And as, as Courtney talked about, we didn't want to build our own silo. This is about bringing together these existing winter advocates who know what this season can mean. And Jake, you've also talked and written about people can kind of reframe their thinking. I know David and I were talking about this earlier about winter to be more of a positive experience and looking forward to the winter months. So what are some mindsets about winter that could be commonly held, but are more detrimental, especially to our physical and mental health? That's, that's a great question. And it's, again, if you're in winter all the time, if you're a, a lifelong Wisconsinite, or if you're very used to winter in, in the Northern parts of North America, uh, 
it's it's not that big a deal to say, oh yeah, there's that white stuff back again. That's no fun. Or oh, snow apocalypse is coming. I guess this is going to be awful. Uh, slip and uh, slick and slippery, or I guess slickery roads in the morning. Uh, we know that snow falling does create logistical issues. We we know that it does mm -hmm. cause a need for caution and safety. We we accept that. We help out our neighbors when they have issues shoveling their walk or getting stuck in a ditch. Uh, but what we don't always recognize is that snow just being on the ground isn't bad. Mm -hmm. It's easy to conflate those things in our mind. And and humans love shortcuts. We're, we're trying to make our experience repeatable and predictable. And we don't actively re-examine the paradigms that we hold about what we see around us. The, the problem is, if you're not thinking through and, and actively examining what's possible, you can really confine your opportunities by coming in with a mindset that isn't allowing you to be creative or think about, oh, maybe there are ways I can enjoy this. Uh, you, you get out to the parking lot and it's snowing out my window. It's, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the snowmobile trail was being groomed outside my house this morning. It's, there, there are so many great things coming, but it does require this short-term caution. So you get out to the parking lot, you've got to clear off your car. That has to be done. You can't drive away with it covered. Uh, it's something you're going to do. So you've got five minutes. You can either hate that the whole time and think about how cold and miserable you are, how your socks are soaked, or there's there will be a negative thing if you go to look for it. You've also got five minutes where your only job is to clear this thing off. It's a big, you know, Toyota Camry shaped uh, uh, Zen garden that you get to clear off. Finding moments of joy in the mundane is important. It's also important to recognize what's possible in winter that isn't possible the rest of the year. What kind of warm beverages do you like to enjoy? You're sitting under a thick blanket, woolen socks near fireplace, a space heater, that coziness, comfort, and this Danish concept of huga, that mm -hmm. is worth embracing. And so when you find those negative things and you recognize how much you enjoy them, uh, rather the positive things and see how much of a difference they can make in your enjoyment of the season, worlds of possibilities open up. It makes it easier to, uh, to exercise and find balance the way we normally would the rest of the year. And Jake, I have one last question for you. And then we actually have a couple from our audience. Might I say, when you're talking about that five minutes of Zen, I feel like you're in my mind when I'm trying to scrape <laughs> off my car because I'm like, oh my God, I got to do this again. But I'm going to start thinking of hot toddies. So maybe that'll get me through it. Exactly. Um, yeah. So of course we know COVID, I was talking to David about this, you know, has hit, especially we're almost going on a year right now. So what advice do you have for some people to kind of plow through to get in the positive mind frame for the rest of our winter? Well, winter mission was always about increasing outdoor recreation and uh, increasing socialization to keep people in touch with each other, connected, and and again, having the energy uh, and, and brain chemistry, so many different effects associated with those two core activities. Of course, that is already something that presents difficulties when there's not a pandemic. When you have a pandemic that makes gathering dangerous and makes uh, exercising potentially difficult with a mask on, there are different considerations. So finding the opportunities that can work for you are all the more important, but in COVID especially, I would say it's important to try to decenter yourself from your experience of COVID. Uh, just like winter, just like wet socks, if all you focus on in COVID is how hard it's been for you, yeah, you're not going to enjoy that experience. And it doesn't have to be enjoyable. Ideally, it's human. Ideally, it's empathetic. So I had the opportunity to volunteer. The UW system has been doing testing for asymptomatic individuals and communities across the state to see hundreds of people come through, all affected by the same thing, all coming for the same test and to learn and take care of themselves from totally different areas and, and walks of life makes you realize this is truly affecting everybody. So the little things, calling people, finding out how you can make a difference for the people you care about is especially important, but even connecting yourself with a bigger cause. What do you wanna volunteer for? What might you donate to? Do you wanna work with AARP and, and chat with people on the phone and have these positive experiences? The other big thing that can make a difference, especially for single parents, for young children, if you've got unused winter gear, so snowshoes, skis, sleds, uh, snow pants, jackets that you don't need, I guarantee you somebody does. And the high cost of starting or trying a new winter sport can be really prohibitive, especially for people of color, for single parents, for underrepresented folks in our community. If, if we can help them better enjoy their winter, we're talking about this idea of population health and moving upstream. Healthcare isn't, can you get to an emergency room if you need one? It's, do you have what you need to stay healthy and be prepared? So with, with COVID, we can't just wait 
and and prepare and become healthy for what we know we're going to face. It's going to be a surprise. So we've got to be proactive and uh, taking care of yourselves and each other being generous can have such a positive impact on your own mental health this winter. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jake. We're going to bring David back. I know we're actually kind of towards the end of our show, but I'm going to kindly ask the producer to bring up one of the questions or comments. I will leave it up to... Okay, so how are some of these recommended winter improvements funded by these communities? And I will open that up to whomever would like to um, respond to that. I can jump in to start that the winter mission program was given a $15,000 grant. That's, that's not much in terms of grants. We chose to see that as a positive. We didn't have enough money to create our own silo or make this whole big new thing without talking to anybody. That doesn't work in a community this size. And that doesn't draw on the expertise and the advocates who by, by right of, of all the work they've done should be leading these things. Uh, so cities can have uh, long-term impacts by looking at what Winter Mission has found, studying these engagement and uh, uh, pilot project ideas. Things like heated bus shelters, things like the way you design a new park, uh, having design standards in place for downtown uh, buildings that might get constructed, being strategic about which sidewalks you choose to plow, which uh, paths you prioritize, and taking into account whether your snowplow plan is, is working only for cars, as Courtney said, or if it can work for pedestrians and bicyclists as well. So cities can, I think, be informed by winter mission. Uh, the long-term benefit is are these these incredible investments that communities make in themselves, the things that stick around for decades. And aligning those with these values uh, doesn't have to be a high cost or prohibitive thing. It's mm -hmm. about adopting the mindset and institutionalizing it so you can make sure you come back to it with each new important park, uh, whether that's in a community, a downtown, or, or somewhere else that people uh, can enjoy using. And um, Jake, speaking on that too, before we get to Arlene's question, is AARP Wisconsin launched small dollar big impact grants last year, which is a grant of up to $1,000 that we award monthly for ideas that you have been talking about, that Courtney has talked about, that David has talked about, you know, making a huge impact in your community with a very small amount. And our next grant cycle is, um, I think next week, if I'm not mistaken, you can find more information about that on the AARP Wisconsin website. So I just wanna plug that because I think Great. that really goes hand in hand. Um, with that, so we have one more question. So from Arlene, the video was great. How have residents reacted to this initiative? And I will, um, maybe Courtney, if you wanted to speak on that. Yeah, I think they've really embraced it. Um, maybe a really good story to capture how they've reacted is recently in the local news, it picked up a story of a father and a son that built a little um, free little sled library. So I don't know if you're familiar with the, the concept of free little libraries, but they built a, a place to hold sleds and um, stocked it with some sleds. And there's been some new sleds that have appeared there. So it's right by a sledding hill um, so that local neighborhood kids can come and go sledding and have a sled access to a sled if they don't have one. I so kind I of want to do one of those. I love that idea. I love that idea. I think that's a great idea. And our viewers right now, you know, they might be throughout the whole state of Wisconsin or maybe even some people out of state and all these ideas that have been talked about how creative, innovative, some are extremely low cost ways of trying to bring this to your community and how that could just change the way that your community thinks and feels about winter. I think this has um, been one of my favorite shows. I've been doing this since May, and it's because we know that it's winter. We cannot avoid it. Um, it's going to be here, but what um, fun and creative ways that we can look at um, winter. So I want to thank so much, Courtney, and I want to thank Jake, and I want to thank David so much from um, the City of Eau Claire University and also Health Department and David from 880 Cities on just spending time with us today thinking of winter a little differently. And if you are watching this video, please make sure to take your friends and your family. You can share this on your Facebook, YouTube page or other social media, just to start planting the seed of how we can change our perspective for the winter months. I wanna thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you, it's great to be here. Great. Thank pleasure. you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, next week's show, if you would love to join us, it'll be next Thursday from twelve, uh, from noon to 12.30. We will be talking all about advocacy. So join us as we talk with Lisa from AARP Wisconsin about the vaccine 
in Wisconsin. There seems to be updates every day, so we can definitely chat with her next Thursday. Please join us on the Facebook.com or YouTube page. And also, I'd love to talk about some upcoming events. So there's trivia, there's a virtual happy hour, livable communities 101, movies for grown-ups, supernova, and protecting loved ones from financial scams and fraud. All of these are happening within the next week. You can visit our website below or the phone number to register. And I want to thank everybody once again for joining us. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to our producer, Darren, for this great show. And I want to um, tell everybody it's snowing today, probably in your area. So what a great opportunity to look at that toolkit that was talked about to start thinking creatively. So thank you guys so much and stay safe.